Government Employees Insurance Company, better known to the world as GEICO, has had a very interesting history on their rise to becoming the second largest auto insurance company in America. They're only second to State Farm, who's number one. As big as GEICO is now, can you believe at one point in their history they almost went bankrupt? Yes, you heard me right, bankrupt. This is such an interesting story with tons of twists and turns. It took restructuring, multiple cash infusions, going public on the stock exchange, being bought out by Warren Buffett, making the company privately owned again, changing management, and much more to make the Geico you know and see today. I know sometimes it's easy to assume someone rolled out of bed, had an idea, created a company, and then made billions of dollars. But like many other iconic companies, that's the furthest thing from the truth. And Geico was no exception to this reality or to the traps of capitalism. Sit back and relax while we take you through the rise, fall, and rise again of America's second largest insurance company, GEICO. Before we start the video, please don't forget to subscribe for more company documentary videos. And be sure to like and share the video as well. We're working aggressively to grow the channel and we need your help. I think it's important to discuss how auto insurance came to be in existence. As most Americans know it's required by law in the United States that all vehicles being driven have and maintain active auto insurance. However, that was not always the case especially when vehicles first became financially affordable by the middle class in America. At one point in our history, auto insurance was non-existent or optional in certain areas of the country. To be honest with you, even thinking about that's scary. Can you imagine a world where people were driving and causing accidents with no way of compensating people for their negligence? I'm getting shaky thinking about it. Okay, let's get back to the documentary. Anyway, with numerous inventions that range from the lightning rod to bifocals, it shouldn't be too surprising that Benjamin Franklin was one of the forefathers of insurance in the United States. According to PBS, Franklin formed the Philadelphia Contribution Ship in 1751, which was the first company in the U.S. colonies to provide fire insurance. Members of the Philadelphia Contribution Ship agreed to make payments that would be used if any other member fell victim to fire-related losses. In the first year, the contribution ship issued 143 policies, which lasted for seven years, PBS reports. Not one insured property caught on fire during that time. Automobile insurance was a little after Ben Franklin's time, but he did recommend coverage that included crop and life insurance, as well as coverage for widows and orphans. Regardless of what type of policy Franklin proposed, the policies all had the same goal, to ease financial burdens that can occur when disaster strikes. While most of us know Detroit as the Motor City, Cleveland and other areas of Ohio were at the forefront of automotive development in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Gilbert J. Loomis holds the distinction of being the first person to buy an automotive insurance policy in 1897, according to the Ohio Historical Society. The policy, which was issued in Dayton, Ohio, protected Loomis if his car damaged property or injured or killed an individual. From that point on, auto insurance slowly started to become more comprehensive. The International Risk Management Institute reports that automotive fire and theft insurance first became available in 1902. In 1912, the precursor to today's auto insurance plans was developing, as insurance companies began combining property, liability, and fire coverage for cars into one policy. In New York, the legislature passed mandatory auto insurance law in 1956, followed by North Carolina in 1957. From that point on, auto insurance picked up the pace. By 1970, 48 states had made auto insurance mandatory. GEICO was formed in 1936 by Leo Goodwin Sr. and his wife Lillian Goodwin to provide auto insurance directly to federal government employees and their families. Since 1925, Goodwin had worked for USAA, who is currently the sixth largest auto insurance company in America. However, please keep in mind the main difference between USAA and GEICO is that USAA is an insurer that specializes in insuring only military personnel. Goodwin Sr. decided to start his own company after rising as far as a civilian could go in USAA's military-dominated hierarchy. The Goodwins funded the creation of GEICO with $25,000 of their own money and $75,000 from Fort Worth, Texas-based banker Cleves Rea, with legal assistance from future GEICO CEO Lorimer Davidson. Based on Goodwin's experience at USAA, GEICO's original business model was predicated on the assumption that federal employees, as a group, would constitute a less risky and more financially stable pool of insureds compared to the general public. 
1937, the Goodwins relocated Geico from San Antonio, Texas to Washington, D.C., and reincorporated the company as a DC corporation after realizing that their business model would work best in the place with the highest concentration of federal employees. In 1948, the Rea family sold its 75% stake of GEICO to a coalition of investors, which was led by Benjamin Graham's Graham-Newman partnership, taking 50%, worth $712,000 at the time. This sale accidentally violated an SEC regulation which forced Graham Newman to divest a portion of their holdings in 1949, resulting in Geico becoming a publicly traded company at $27 a share. Graham Newman's investment in Geico eventually resulted in a position worth $400 million by 1972, which was by far Graham Newman's best investment and outperformed the rest of their portfolio combined. In 1951, Warren Buffett, then a Columbia University graduate student under Benjamin Graham, interviewed Lorimer Davidson, then a VP, and named GEICO the security I like best. From 1948 to 1958, GEICO's market capitalization grew almost 50 times. In 1958, Goodwin retired and was succeeded by Lorimer Davidson, who grew the company's insurance premiums at a compound rate of 16% annually from $40 million to $250 million over his tenure. Davidson retired and was replaced in 1970 by Ralph Peck, President and COO, and David Lloyd Krieger, chairman and CEO, who had been one of the other investors in 1948. In the mid-1970s under Ralph Peck, president and COO, and David Lloyd Krieger, chairman and CEO, GEICO found itself near bankruptcy. The financial health of the company was in a mess after the recently installed management grossly underestimated the insurer's loss costs and simultaneously underpriced its customers' insurance policies. In the insurance world, that combination of failure is a death sentence for an insurance company. If an insurance company does not properly assess potential losses, they're doomed to fail and become insolvent. In GEICO's case, their management failed to properly estimate losses and policy pricing. This caused GEICO to improperly reserve for potential future losses. In the insurance world, reserves are the lifeblood of the company. Reserves are funds set aside for the future payment of incurred claims that have not yet been settled. When GEICO's claim payments came due, GEICO did not have enough money to cover the required cost of those claims. Warren Buffett, seeing opportunity in a disaster and believing in GEICO as a company, purchased $4.1 million worth of common stock. He then helped save the company by buying an additional $19.4 million of convertible stock in the company. Buffett then appointed Jack Byrne as the CEO of GEICO in 1976. Buffett said that Byrne was the perfect man for the job to turn the company around. At the time, Byrne initiated a three-step rescue plan. Byrne fired more than 1,500 employees, reducing the staff to fewer than 6,400, and closed 23 sales offices. The company also stopped writing policies in several states. Following these three cost-cutting steps, Buffett was impressed. Buffett ended up buying over one-third of the company, a portion that later grew to roughly half without spending a penny. With Buffett's investments and Byrne's three-step rescue plan, the company was saved and it regained its reputation and profitability. However, business growth was still a struggle. But in 1995, Buffett sensed the company would do better and bought the remaining 50% of the company. After this disaster was averted, it was time to get back to expanding the company. This is where the CEO that built the modern-day Geico comes in. The CEO's name was Tony Nicely who had been with GEICO since 1961. He actually started with the company working in the mailroom and rose to become the man that made GEICO a multi-billion dollar company. He was promoted to CEO in 1993. After Nicely's promotion in two years, the GEICO growth jumped and the insurer was back in business. Nicely managed to boost the company's sales by an amazing 1,200% since the time Buffett bought the company in 1995. Tony's management of GEICO increased Buffett's company Berkshire's intrinsic value by more than $50 billion. Soon enough, the underwriting profits of GEICO totaled $15.5 billion pre-tax since Berkshire's purchase and float available for investment had grown from $2.5 billion to $22.1 billion. Nicely expanded the customer base through a new four-company strategy. Along with it came an increased advertising budget, which propelled GEICO toward much higher national visibility. That led to national advertising on an enormous scale. GEICO's ads and direct mail pieces flooded the airwaves and filled mailboxes around the country, and the company's growth shot upward. 
The Geico Gecko made its first appearance during the 2000 television season and quickly became an advertising icon. Meanwhile, in 2001, Leo Goodwin was named to the International Insurance Society Hall of Fame. And by 2002, Geico had passed the 5 million policyholder mark. In August 2004, Geico declared the good news about re-entering the New Jersey auto market at a press conference in Trenton that made local, regional, and national news. That was also the year that Geico introduced the cavemen to television audiences in order to drive home the point that using Geico.com was so easy even a caveman can do it. The rest, as they say, is advertising history. Later that year, Geico broke ground for a new office in Buffalo, New York, to help handle Geico's thriving business. And by December, company growth pushed Geico to 6 million policyholders. In 2006, Geico's marketing efforts, expanding internet capabilities and customer outreach, combined to attract the company's 7 millionth policyholder. Geico's success continued throughout 2007, as the company grew to 8 million policyholders. Geico Auto Repair Express also rolled out into more than 400 repair shops around the nation, giving policyholders a full-service package of extras like on-site shop representatives and rental vehicle reservation services. After that, things really took off for Geico. They set a monthly record for sales and growth, adding its 15 millionth and 16 millionth policies during 2017 and its 17 millionth early in 2019. However, by 2022, Geico's policies fell back under 17 million. For nearly 30 years since 1995, Geico has had year-over-year -year success in growth of market share and profit. However, during and after the pandemic, they started to see a decline in their steady growth. Geico's success was primarily accomplished by selling their policies directly to customers through sales agents and through the internet during the time of the dot-com rise. This allowed Geico to maintain the majority of their profits when selling insurance to customers. While Geico was following the strategy, the majority of all the other major insurance companies used insurance agents exclusively to sell their policies. When these agents executed a sell, they were paid far more in commissions and also received residual income from these insurance companies. This resulted in a high loss of income for a lot of the other insurance companies. However, since that time, other major insurance companies such as Progressive Insurance, State Farm Insurance, Allstate Insurance, Liberty Mutual Insurance, etc. have all moved to a more customer direct model. Also, all of these companies have established their own express repair shops and other features previously only offered through GEICO. I'm pointing all of this out to say GEICO is no longer the exclusive carrier of these exclusive perks. Essentially, all of these other companies offer the same thing. At this point, most customers are looking for savings and good customer service. So everyone at this point is just swapping out customers. The main challenge Geico faces is trying to stay innovative, especially when every other insurance company offers the same thing. Another major issue for Geico is their top competitor, Progressive Insurance. Geico has been handily beaten by Progressive over the past handful of years on volumes, underwriting, and profitability. This reality hasn't been lost on shareholders or Warren Buffett's company, Berkshire, who owns Geico. It's been a frequent topic of discussion at the annual meetings. This comment from Buffett at the 2012 meeting is noteworthy. In hindsight, I bet he'd agree that he overstated Geico's competitive position, at least relative to Progressive. Buffett said Progressive has probably been the leader in telematics, which is the little device that you hook to your car. This device tracks your driving patterns to help insurance companies to properly assess your risk level as a driver. This information also helps them determine how much you should be charged each month. Buffett went on to say, we've not done that at GEICO, but if we think there becomes a superior way of evaluating the likelihood of anybody having an accident, we'll do it. Obviously, if you could ride in a car with somebody for six months, you might learn a bit about the propensity of having an accident, particularly if they didn't know you were there. But I do not see that as being a major change. We're always looking for more things that will tell us someone's likelihood of having an accident in the next year. But I don't think that this new experiment threatens GEICO. Our marketing, risk selection, and retention are working extremely well. GEICO's a machine. I'll agree GEICO's done good for themselves without this information, but I would also argue Progressive Insurance has done better. With Progressive having so much data such as driving patterns, time spent in the car, accident history, speeding rates, etc., they've been able to maximize their growth and profitability. These are the types of innovations GEICO failed to capitalize on at their infancy. Now it's become an Achilles heel for them, especially with the world becoming ever more so based in data and analytics. The last thing I want to touch on briefly that I think would really harm the stability of this company is GEICO's employee problem. 
Since the pandemic, GEICO's been fighting with their employees. From trying to force them back into the office, taking away their bonuses, tightening restrictions on employees, layoffs, etc., it seems the old way of GEICO's no more. If GEICO chooses to become more hostile to their employees, it will not end well for them. In this type of industry, employees really are the lifeblood of the company. They've made these people so upset, there's a literal Reddit group of current and ex-employees trashing the company all over the internet. Also, there's stories of possible strikes, unionizing rumors, threatening letters being sent to executives' homes, and much more drama. It's a lot going on. So again, this is something they'd want to watch. Overall, I think Geico will be a company that will last. I feel they've done everything necessary to create a solid foundation for themselves to be a lasting company. If Geico continues to innovate, seize on every opportunity, and puts a focus back on their employee development, they'll have a bright future and possibly be the number one auto insurance company in America. So what do you guys think? Do you like Geico? Are you a Geico customer? Do you like their customer service? Have any of you worked for them? If yes, how is your experience working for them? Please let us know in the comments below. I would love to hear what you have to say. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more company documentary videos. And be sure to like and share the video as well. We're working aggressively to grow the channel and we need your help. Thanks. See you in the next video.